to put crown in that. <laughs> hey guys, it's RC here with the Rescue Boss. Uh, tonight we're doing a go live video with uh, a friend of mine that we used to teach a lot of classes together with, uh, Curtis Kyer. Um, Curtis is from the Cumberland Trail Fire District in St. Clair, Ohio. And tonight we're talking about a class that he and I did, what, probably 10 years ago now, Curtis? Yeah, yeah. So, um, we're going to talk about what you carry in your pocket and what kind of tools you carry, why you carry them, and those kind of things. So um, we're going to just have a little chat about that. We're waiting on some people to get on there live. I see like four or five people now are starting to get on there live. So, Curtis, we've talked about there's a lot of different tools that everybody carries. And the one biggest thing that I think you and I really agree on is um, finding tools that work for you and what runs you go on and what your district covers, right? So, um, you know, what works for me in the Pleasant Valley Joint Fire District versus you at the Cumberland Trail Joint Fire District is sometimes different because our run different runs are different and our area is different. And um, those kind of things really play a big factor in what we carry and some of the decisions on what we carry for those kind of things. So um, let's start out. What's one of the biggest things that you use in your pocket right now? Let's see. I mean, I, I, I'm sure we're we'll end up talking about all of them, but I probably, use trauma shears out of my pocket the most. And it's not just because of EMS, which I don't do a whole lot of anymore, but um, the um, I've used it to cut carpet in accidents. I've used it to cut the door wires. Um, probably trauma shears would be one of the things I've probably replaced in my pockets in the 20 some years. I've probably gone through several pair of ruining them, you know, on call. So um, I always like having them because they're a good cutting tool um but other than that you know uh the the six-way wrench or now I, i've seen one at lowe's the other day it's a nine-way now um the screwdriver and phillips with the different sizes i use that thing all the time just even in the station so mm -hmm. you know that's probably the other one that i use the most because it's got the different sizes for the, um, the phillips the screwdriver plus if you take it off you got the nut uh driver on it which is the nut size usually on the back of dryers and appliances so use that one a lot too i think that for me and the, the tool that i never thought i'd use a ton was a shove knife <laughs> i have a shove knife and every time i've used it i can't get it to work i'm not smart enough for it or something but um i have it i i've carried it for a long time and i think the reason it's still in my pockets is because it's light it, I, yeah. I don't i know it's there but I, it's not a weight issue so it's it's in there and you know for an interior door it doesn't seem to be a problem but i've not really had any luck with it on exterior doors um, for, for us we are on we get caught on a ton of um residential lockouts so people just lock themselves out of their house and we go over and help them get into their house and i think that's where we use ours a lot so kind of like kicking back on this with the shove knife i think one of the biggest things you got to um do obviously is get out there and try it no one of those things yeah. The other thing that we use a lot with those are wedges and um have you seen any of the air wedges yet they're small yeah like, using car doors but you can go to lowe's home depot and buy yeah. they're just a little bag and you can throw them in there and help you out there too so um, i carry one of them little air wedges with me it's like a blood pressure cuff thing you just pump it up in there it opens a gap up just enough and you can use a shove knife and it works all day long. We do carry a, a forcible entry bag, a door bag that's got uh, a lot of the stuff in it. And uh, Chief Slavic had kind of brought that idea to us. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, we we cross man so many different vehicles with two stations. So, you know, there's a, that's a lot of money in one bag. And right now there's a bag in the engine at station two and there's a bag in the rescue at station one, but we don't have it on the ladder. Now that is truck work, but um, you know, anytime the ladder is going to go out for us, that means the, the engine at the other station is going to be going. So usually it ends up there, but you know, it'd be nice if we could outfit one or two more kits. So we had them on more apparatus and then, you know, that little uh, bag would be a nice thing. But, um, like I said, I, I have the shove knife. I've just never had a, a, a whole lot of luck with it. Um, and, and, you know, I do try it. It is something that will kind of scratch too. So it's hard to it's kind of hard to do it and practice it without scratching something, but um, it's in there. And I've got a crescent wrench too. Uh, 
more if I decide that we're going to take the battery terminal off instead of cutting it. Mm -hmm. But uh, small crescent wrench is usually do that. Yeah, I found a um, Craftsman's got a little multi kind of tool that doesn't matter. You don't have to screw it down. It's just like you throw it onto the nut and it'll just go back and forth with it, which works out really yeah. well too. Um, and again, it was a little foldable thing. And it's like you said, small and light's my biggest thing. And that's the one of the biggest probably things that I've been trying to do lately is again, as I get older, I'm going, man, I need to lighten my stuff up and figure things out. So, um, I, and I'll, I'll kind of reevaluate and yeah. see, you know, <laughs> do I really need this? Like I carry a bow ring and the damn thing. It's so heavy, but you know, I think I spent 150 bucks on it and it's almost like I'm going to carry it despite myself, but, um, you know, it's in there because it can be used as a repel aid and all these other things. And I probably have only used it maybe three times since I bought it. I don't know how long ago. Right. Um, so it, it is a weight issue in that. Um, but pretty much everything else is I use a lot. Uh, I carry a certain amount of small tools in my right uh, coat pocket and then the certain amount of heavier tools in my right uh, hip pocket. Um, and so like usually for my crew, when we're discussing it, you know, we kind of discuss how you carry it, where you're carrying it. Um, you know, it's, if you're supposed to carry it on your right hand side and, um, you know, I like how you said too, it, it everybody's going to do it a little bit differently. Um, for webbing, I carry a 15 foot piece of webbing. Um, years ago, I kind of realized that, um, the length of the things that I wanted to do with it, 15 worked for me. One of our guys has taken uh, firefighter two and one of his instructors is a, a rescue guy from Columbus. So I just realized the other day was an instructor of mine in at Hawking a long time ago, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, he carries a 20 foot and says, you shouldn't have anything less than 20. And I told my guy, you, you know, 15 is enough. And, you know, so I'm like, you know, he's doing rescue. He's doing different things than I am. I'm cross manning vehicles. 20 foot is a lot of rope or a piece of webbing that I don't think I need. Um, so it does make a difference in what, you know, what you find out. We've had Captain Lash down and did ladder stuff with us. You know, the things that he's carrying in his pockets were also different. He was a, a one vehicle individual and, you know, he, would have come to things a lot more often. You know, there's things that guys like that do, and our, our former chief, uh, John Slavic, there's things that he did in DC that he did daily that I might do once in my career at Kremlin Trail. Yeah. And some of the door things that we've done has been that way. And, uh, you know, when you can go 20 some years and only do a certain type of door once or twice, and those guys were doing it daily, that's going to determine a lot about what you're carrying in your pockets, too. So and when you start talking about we're uh, evaluating, um, stuff in your gear and that kind of thing you know it's really in the last six months i've moved from the right front seat of the fire truck to the fire suv being the command guy and i'm like why am i carrying some of this stuff but then there's as you talk though there's the possibility of me cross manning so there you know if the medic's gone i might be on the right front seat of that fire truck now so i still carry some of that stuff but it's really um you know, you want to, I really reevaluate it sometimes. And uh, I still carry a small bag with me of extra stuff. And, and I, I carry things that I wanted, you know, when I was the engine officer, there were some things that I carried with me that I wanted to have, but I didn't want necessarily to weight down my fire gear with. So um, I still carry that bag with me even today. And then my, when I drive the fire SUV, I carry it and take it with me because you know, again, there might, I might be out by myself and, might have to use something out of there so i imagine if i had one apparatus to get on um I th and i think this would go for anybody i think you would have things on there that you've purchased and put on it but there again for us um, we have a rescue engine that goes out on uh, primaries for a different a lot of different calls we have a we call it a reserve engine but it's there to go out on mutual aid fires we got the ladder truck we got a brush truck um, and, and then of course, depending on the number of calls, you can still end up on the, on the ambulance, even if you weren't scheduled for, to do it that day. So right. it's hard to, to store the stuff where you need it. And so I've seen, uh, I've seen your uh, post, uh, it's been a while back when you posted your bag that you carried with the extra stuff in it. Right. And I thought that was a really good idea. Um, something, you know, this isn't necessarily a, a what in your pocket, but I use a, uh, a five eleven a shoulder bag. I cut the shoulder strap off of it and that's what I use for my mask bag. And I was able to put a lot of stuff in that. Um, 
Uh, we have run cards that I put in there. You know, I got a couple different, you know, the door wedge things. You know how every time you went to FDIC, you picked up a new way to to wedge a door open, you know, and I have a couple of those things hanging on there. Uh, one of my favorite, I did quit carrying it on my uh, jacket, I think, and sometimes there's one on there, is a clamp, a two-inch Craftsman plastic clamp. Um, and those things work perfect because you can stick it on the door and it's going to keep it from shutting. But I've used it for other things, too. Right. Um, I tell you that. But, go ahead. And we start talking about other bags and just throwing all your winter gear, other winter clothes, extra gloves, yeah. that kind of stuff too. Especially now, the time you know, riding back to the firehouse on the wet shirt gets to be a pain in the butt. I do, I do have a uh, a bag which um, it's what it is. The bag's actually a golf shoe bag um, that I got from the college uh, when I was working out there steady. And uh, they had some leftovers, and I think I gave you and several other guys one, Lance and Justin, and and um, we I use that for my little winter bag. So I've got you know, it's like you said, sweatshirt, um, t-shirt, extra Nomex and gloves and things like that for the winter calls. And it's most of the time, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's hanging in my locker because it's just something else I'd have to carry to the to the vehicle I'm going to. But it's there, I can grab it. You know, if if it's toned out as a confirmed structure fire, and I'm putting my stuff on in front of my locker um you know it's it's hanging right there i can grab it or i can grab it on the way to the engine so right. uh, i'm actually very lucky where my locker's at um i can any vehicle that i'm going to get on in that in the station i have to go past my locker to get to it so um i've been there since i started and i I'm, i love that spot because that's a good reason for it and um so yeah that's good so you already made mention of webbing um the other thing talk yeah. about what too, though the you know that's probably maybe my third most used and i've used that on extrications and pulled items with it but uh if you recall a couple years ago we had a semi-accident over here right. and uh it was um upside down and the driver was pinned his leg was pinned under the seat uh, myself and another guy was in there could not get this seat off of him so you're talking about an air ride seat it was several hundred pounds and we're basically working off of our stomach so we couldn't uh deadlift it so the rope side of me come out we actually was having uh the towing company bill's towing was staging and we were getting ready to take the door off so it was actually on its side it was on its side laying on the passenger side the guy was away he was laying the seat was under or over top of his leg and um so we were actually getting ready to take the driver's door off and Bills was going to lower in their hook to strap onto this seat to lift it. And somehow or another, I don't know what made me think of it. I thought about doing a three to one with a piece of webbing. So I took my piece of webbing, tied it off, did more of a trucker's hitch to make a three to one. Mm -hmm. And I could move the seat. Um, I moved it just enough, but not quite enough. So I said, well, both of us need to do it. So we had one of the guys pull, threw in their piece of rope, which was a 15 foot piece of rope. I did the exact same thing. Um, we used the oh shit handle above the door was one of the anchors, believe it or not. And it was, it held just enough to hold that couple hundred pounds. Um, and the other one, I think we went through the, uh, you know, the little vent window uh, on the other part. So it was very weak anchors, strapped it to it and both of us lifted. So basically we rolled over on our back and pulled down to our chest. We were able to lift the seat up off of him about three or four inches. And then the guys outside just pulled him very painfully, um, pulled him and got him out. Uh, but that one there is stuck in my mind a lot because um, that that wouldn't have been possible. Now, Bills was sitting there, you know, 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes. But right. it only took about two minutes for me to tie that up and for us to yank it up off there. And um, so that one there is always stuck in my mind for the piece of webbing. If you can if you know how to do different types of knots and stuff and you understand how those things work, you can use those things to to benefit you in very unique thinking outside the box situations. Right. <clears throat> And, you know, it, speaking of webbing, and I don't know if it was your guys or somebody over there. My sister obviously worked in the ER for a while in the wheeling. Somebody brought her a patient in that was webbing back to the backboard, you know. Again, most of us haven't done that in I don't know how long. Yeah. But so a little funny story is, is my sister looked at him and said, all right, undo this. And they were like, just cut the webbing. And she's like, no. <laughs> I have to my house. I'm not doing that. Do you understand what kind of... My father and my brother were like. I was gonna say her father well, and her brother would have killed her for that. Yeah, he was like, untie this stuff, and they, you know, the EMS crew come in and untied it. But that's another thing that, again, you and I that grew up together and, and grew up in the younger or the or earlier years, where 
that's how we would lash somebody to a backboard when we first started yeah. or showed you how to do that. I don't know that anybody now in the last probably 10 or 15 years even knows how to lash somebody to a backboard using a piece of webbing. Yeah, it was it was there when I started, um, and the older guys knew how to do it, and we might have practiced it once or twice, but it never happened because right at that time is also when spider straps come out. So the first couple of years I was there, you know, we were still using the buckle straps, and then right after that, spider straps come out. Once that happened, there was no need to mess with a thirty foot piece of webbing, no. you know, ten minutes to lash somebody down, um, and so it kind of went away. But um, you know. There again, we are using it in the Stokes baskets and stuff. So if you had to you tie somebody on a backboard, it's available to you to be able to – and we know how to do that part. So it's yeah. easy to, to be able to tie somebody down. Right. So, um, well, obviously, the other thing with webbing, I liked it. And I liked it on multiple aspects, that five-loop webbing. Um, we all – you and I had taken – they were the five-foot pieces of webbing, and we looped them together. Yeah. Um, Alan Kettle showed us how to do that, or he come up and showed us. The mast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I introduced us to the mast, and then you and I kind of stole that idea with yeah. using pieces of webbing. <laughs> yeah. And the other one, I tell you right now, and, and I'll throw a plug out for my buddies at Rock and Rescue. They're making a wonderful five loop strap right now. It's fairly inexpensive, and um, it's a nice little piece of apparatus to use. And again, out for my buddies at rock and rescue because we know they've supported us and we'd like to help with them guys out but they got a nice five loop thing so if anybody's looking for one of them it's they're a good place and good company good if, old one you know if if you're not familiar with it you should be because um i was always um uh, on the smaller end of the scale i had the height but i didn't have a lot of weight compared to other guys and, and you and i were always like that you and i was opposite uh, and still are to a lot of aspects right. and i had to figure out I've always said that it, it, you, it doesn't matter how much strength you have or, or the weight to put behind it, but you need to know how to, to, to use it to your advantage. And what I found out with that five loop strap um, or the mast, if we had the one, you know, if you had the purchased one, was that I was able to, to move a guy three times my size with it um, because the weight distributed the weight. So I used to carry one of those in my pocket. It was one of the things I've thrown out. And the reason is, is that we've put, we put it with our rip pack. Right. Um, at the time, um, since you had mentioned Al, you know Alan Ketzel, he um, he wanted one on all of his uh, air packs. So he bought all the webbing. Um, we made we made them. I, I actually sewed the bags myself and uh, hooked them on there. And then I had extra bags that we had done up uh, for Cumberland Trail, and they were they float around. You know, I still see them. They're there, and probably a lot of guys don't even know what they are. But you know, it is there, and I have showed some of them. Hey, this is here. If, if it's somebody that's bigger, and you take that with you. You can strap it on there. It's a lot more, you know, places to grab a hold, uh, grab a hold of, and things like that. So yeah, there uh, we still have them, and they still get used on occasion, you know, in training. But and again, I we put them in all of our rip bags, and I took them out of my pocket just because it was getting so bulky and heavy and that kind of thing. But you said, like you said, it, ours is in our rip bag. I'll tell you the other place that I fell in love with it was um, we were doing confined space training and, you know, trying to get somebody into a sked and a 24 inch hole is no good. Um, so where that five loop was nice to go in, boom, 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 and gone. Or if it's a real tight spot, you can do um, wristlets or you can ankle lets, you know, you, it worked really, really well. So what I, the other thing I've liked about that, and again, why I'm kind of glad it's on the rip bag is that, um, you know, we did some training. You've, uh, you know, you've come in the back of our fire station and we built a simulated window on that set of steps, you know, when you come into the station that we could do bailouts. And um, we wanted to be able to, to practice uh, firefighter rescues out of a basement using the ladder technique or doing a self rescue. And, you know, that's where the mast would be a great asset too, because you can have it hooked to a Halligan, have it outside the window on the outside of it, drop that down in there. And now you're climbing out of it somewhat as a ladder. Now, obviously that's a conscious patient, you know, to self rescue, but there's a lot of places for that. And I don't, I'm not necessarily saying it needs to be in your pocket, but if it's on the apparatus and somewhere where it's accessible, um, I think it's a it's a valuable tool to have around, and there, and again, you can make them yourself, and um, for a fraction of the cost, if you can tie a water knot, so um, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah. Um, so th we're talking about ropes and webbing and stuff. Let's uh, let's talk about you do carry anything for bailout because I carry about a 
a 30 foot piece of rope, a 30 or 35 to 40, I forget what it is, in my gear. And I'm done the traditional whack around me, bail out kind of thing. But um, there's a lot now, you know, a lot more again, bail out things and bail out devices and those kind of things. Do you carry anything rope wise to bail out? You made mention so, the one thing. But. Yeah. So we have uh, bailout bags. Um, we had them a long time ago. And uh, last year, I think it was last year, um, you know, I was looking at them. It, they, they were really weathered. The bags were really weathered from the sun coming through the windows. And they, they were old. Um, a lot of the ropes were starting to show some, some issues. So I approached it, uh, the chief chief about, I was like, look, we're, we're not really using them anymore. They, they they were so awkward flopping around when they were attached to the air packs. And um, it, it's an awkward device just to have around if it's not in a pocket. Um, he didn't want to do away with it. So what we ended up doing was is we did replace them all, went with a, a, an easier to use device. Um, we went to just a figure eight, uh, a, the mini eight device um, with the idea that you're using the mini eight if you're a little bit more controlled and not on it as, as much in a rush. Whereas if, and we practiced it, wrapping the rope around you, if it's a, you got to get out because you're going to die, then it's wrap the rope around you and go out. Um, but what, how we've done it uh, and set up our policy for it is, is that they're hanging with all of the SCBAs. We're supposed to be taking them in with us on anything that's a commercial structure or a multi-level residential. And I'm going to tell you, as an officer, it's it's not happening because again, it's it's so cumbersome to have around. Um, you know, I I I try to even push myself to do it, but they're there. Again, it's something that is there for us to grab. Shame on us if we don't have it, but it's available. Um, you know, we we didn't have. I really would like to see the ones that are a part of the SCBA that are. You know, it's it's already in it. You can grab the rope. It's on you all the time. Um, without the bag flopping around and being such a nuisance, but um, you know that's a that's a huge cost. Yeah. So, but I do not the the fifteen foot piece of webbing or a piece of rope, one or the other, is what's I was what I carry my my pocket as far as that. And then I I got a couple of carabiners in different locations on me too, so that I always have the availability of a carabiner. So that um, you know I've taught the guys to do a munter hitch. On a carabiner there again if you if you want to bypass that eight or you're in a hurry and you want to be able to control your descent you know do the monitor hitch on it and and do it that way so a lot several of the guys have learned you know some different things that they can do so and again as we talked earlier we start talking about uh, run districts and those kind of things uh, i can tell you that for the most part in our village has a an ordinance that 35 foot's the tallest building in the district so I know that a 40 footer is going to probably get me close enough, you know, to the ground is where, you know, some people tell you, oh, you got to carry 75, 80 footer, whatever, whatever. But I know that a 40 footer is going to, for the most part, get me to the ground in my district because yeah. I don't have anything. But, you know, where you, you've got some taller buildings in the district and that kind of thing, you might, you know, again, might go a little bit longer than, than my 30 footer or 35 footer, whatever I'm carrying. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So. What else? Um, what other odd things have you seen anybody carrying anything? Um, I'll tell you something that I've been carrying for the last uh, four or five years is keys. Um, every time a, a new business opens up and we're touring around, um, you know, if it's a if it's a new system or a system that has a key that I don't have, I, I get a key and I put it on a ring and I that's been so helpful to save from having to track them down and that we have, there's actually some businesses that don't even have their keys anymore. Um, so it's been really difficult if, if you need to reset the, the pool station or something. So um, I think if the officer is doing that, um, you know, obviously it's not something everybody needs or everybody should have, but just having the keys on there for all the different systems because simplex and, you know, there's so many different ones and then different ages of them, they change the keys over the years. Um, but when they, when they install that stuff, when you're doing your walkthroughs and they're installing that stuff, you know, those pool stations and stuff probably each come with two keys. And, and, and if you look back in the, where the alarm panel is, there's a ring back there with a hundred keys on it. 
Um, and then by the time the building gets done, nobody knows what those keys are for and they get pitched and you might be lucky for the manager to have one or two. Right. Um, and, you know, I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many times we've walked in the door and it's the pool station by the exit because it's a kid or something, you know, and I, I can have the have it reset immediately and hit the enunciator at the front door. So um, those those keys, that I think, have saved my crew a lot of time, sometimes resetting systems and. Um, I think a couple of other lieutenants kind of started to do the same thing. And um, our, our, we had a former chief that carried him with him all the time. And uh, when he left us, uh, those were available and I grabbed a hold of it and I've been building on it ever since. Um, so it, it went from about five that he used to carry. There's probably 10 or 15 keys on there now. Right. Um, and uh, I need to get an Allen wrench or two on there because uh, uh, there's a couple pool stations that use Allen wrenches. Mm -hmm. um, I need to figure out like which size that is and, and you know, add that to the ring. But uh, um, I think that's been a big help. I, I ended up going out and buying a couple of uh, elevator fire service keys. Yeah. You know, they, they work and, and for the, fire, the one and two and all that other stuff. So, um, yeah, and that, again, I don't carry that on my person. That's in my extra bag just for those kind of extra things, but that's a I would like tool. to get a couple of those, um, you know, for the, through the lock part of it, I like to get a couple or make a couple of those and, um, have them a little bit more accessible. We, we they are in that, that force of wintry bag I was talking about. Um, but I think that can be made that the tools that are in my right pocket. I did the, the fire hole, the fire hose holder. So it was the one we seen years ago where, you know, it's, you got your centerpiece of inch and three quarter with the rubber in it, and then you wrap around uh, the outside of it. And then, you know, you put everything that you want in it and then you duct tape it. So the duct tape's gonna keep everything tight that you got in there. And that's where I keep the slide knife and the scissors, the, uh, I do have a multi-tool in there, uh, a window punch. Um, so that's where I keep all those small things at. And so that, those, those, through the lock keys would be nice to, you know, that would slip in there really easy. And um, there's been a couple times, even the other day, as a matter of fact, that I wish that was in my pocket and it wasn't. But um, yeah, that one of the neat ones I found in, uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember the guy's name. They float on, on the social media and stuff. <clears throat> they took an, an old can opener and bent the ends of it and made it through the lock uh, tool. It's really neat. Okay. For, like when you spin the drum off there and you go in there, you got to flip the latch. It's a two dollar can opener, and I ended up um, when I was lieutenant. I bought like four or five of them and bought them, <laughs> bent them up, and gave them to my crew. I was like, "Here, keep these. This is for you." And put a key ring on it, and you can put it on a carabiner in your pocket, and it's you got to through the lock kit for yourself. So, yeah, yeah. Um, that's another great tool. And again, sometimes it's just seeing those kind of things. That little thing like that that you can see on the internet to to make those kind of things because. I had no idea until I seen somebody else do it. And I went, yeah. Oh, look at yeah. that. And I went and found those kind of things. So, um, what other good things do you carry? Anything cutter wise? I like the, the cable cutters, the one that, um, yeah. that, that will wrap around the nice cable ones. Um, I used to have that in uh it was another one of those show buys, you know, spent 80 bucks on a $20 tool <laughs> because yeah. it had a, a spanner and a pry thing on it. But, I, I quit carrying it. It was too long. It was over heavy. Um, and I, that's another, that's probably third or fourth on my list of most used. And I've, I've had to replace them because I've used them so much. Right. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's a banged up car and we're not going to worry about cutting the battery, you know, destroying, make it worse than cutting the battery cables is really nice. It's usually something somebody's yelling for, you know, to cut the door wires and um, everything else. So I do use that uh, a lot. Um, so okay. that, that, right. Go ahead. You use that because you've got X amount of I-70 and you guys run a lot of car crashes. Yeah. We're, we are more extrication and accident than we are, our fire knock on wood. Um, you right. know, the, the, we, we got I-70 and a lot of state routes, you know, state route nine goes, uh, north and south through the center of our area, uh, uh state route 331 airport road. Um, you know, we have we are the hub of Belmont County when you look at the roads and how everything goes. And so we do get a lot of accidents and, um, 
you know, I, I don't know whether it's true, but I, I, I know, you know, I've heard a lot of rumors where, uh, you know, this, our part of I-70 is supposed to be one of the, the more dangerous and congested parts because um, the tunnels and, and wheeling go down to, to single lanes going through. It's the only place anywhere in the United States where I-70 goes down to one lane. And, you know, now that doesn't affect us in a sense, but what that, what I'm getting at is, is that, that kind of backing up to us, I, I just feel like that always like, it affects traffic in some way because we've got 470 coming into our area and people are taking 470 to bypass the tunnel. And, um, you know, we've got, there's, you know, yourself, there's places where the accidents happen constantly. You could put a dot on there and know, and think of how many times you've been there. And, uh, the 470 I-70 interchange is one of them for us. So yeah, we do a lot more extrication. Yeah. And again, that's, that's what you guys do a lot. So you got to make sure your tools and what you're carrying is right specific for you. So, um, yeah, because I, I think in, in this entire time we've been doing this, I've talked more about the stuff I've used in an extrication situation than in a fire situation. And that's because that's what that's what they're getting right. used on. So, um, uh, you know, the, the fire stuff for us, it's either it's either a quick knockdown or by the time we, you know, anybody's seen it and we got there, there's not a whole lot left. We, we There's not a whole lot of in the middle for us. So it's not like we've had a lot of the other things and then. Thankfully, get there again. I, I think our commercial, in a sense, is still somewhat newer uh, compared to a lot of other places. So, you know, because of that, the, the fire code is is probably prevented a lot of things like it's supposed to. Um, you know, we're not in an area where the commercial structures are so old that they're they you know they're so outdated and it's a bigger issue. So we've been fortunate with that too. And your and most of your houses are in a newer your newer houses. I mean, you just thought yeah we we have a mix of that. There's a big mix of that. Now out you get outside of our district and it um, it starts to get older as you go. But yeah, in, in our district, it's going to be. You can get anything from a hundred year old house to a two day old house because right. uh, you know yeah. tearing them down and rebuild them as quick as they you know they can do it. So cool. Um any other things you think of or anything that uh I think I still carry one of them little collapsible spanners and I'm if if it's in my pocket, I'm almost positive it is. It's it's been a maybe a few weeks or a month before since I've had to wash my gear and had it actually emptied out. So but I think I've got the original spanner wrench that I bought in 1995. <laughs> so <laughs> it's in there more for, uh, uh, for that reason than it, the fact that it gets used. But, yeah. um, you know, those are always nice because it never fails. You're so far away from the apparatus when you're tearing hose down. But, you know, it used to be <laughs> a long time ago, you know, four inch threaded LDH, you know, those that would still help you now with the storts. That's that is one of the other reasons why I do have that bow ring with me is that bow ring can be used on storage connection. So um, and, and a couple of times I've used it. It's because I'm 400 feet away from the the apparatus and, you know, it's in my pocket and it's easier to pop it off. But um, I'm trying to think uh, I have the the bolt cutter or not bolt cutters, but the, the cable cutters, the bow ring, uh, the screwdriver. And I keep the webbing. So I bought one of those uh, pouches off, off the fire store that slides down in there. It's like a, you know, it's your tool slide in it. Right. And I've always liked that because it keeps everything upright. They're not laying flat. So I can reach in there and feel with my hands the top of the, the cutters or the screwdriver or whatever. Um, what I started doing with my webbing for a long time was I had it in there. Um, I rolled it up and actually had it in that and then just had the carabiner just barely hanging out of my pocket so I could grab it. And then uh, recently, uh, the turnout gear we have right now, I never used radio pocket. I've got the webbing in my radio pocket. And you know what? It's I really like it there. Um, I've got it down in there. I've got the uh, the flap going through the carabiner. So if I grab the carabiner and pull it, it'd be like a rip cord and the, and the webbing is going to come out. Uh, for years, we used to have morning pride gear years ago, um, and it was, and actually I found this out doing the research when you and I were going to do the class was, and I did it was put it in my knee pad. Mm -hmm. um, the, I had the morning pride gear, you take the knee pad and lay it out, flake your webbing in there and pull it down. And then, you know, one of my friends would just pull it out of the, of the, uh, the knee right. pad and, um, it was a great place to have it, but it got pulled out as a joke more often than it did to be actually used. So 
uh, but the you know the knee pads don't exist anymore in a lot of that gear, so the part the radio pocket works really nice for that. I like the the thing too, even putting just the knot out if you don't have a carabiner, just put the knot. Yeah, the knot. Yeah, um, we did that. We so we've got our rescue task force bags or our active shooter bags, and we went through some training the other day, and our guys. We had it rolled up real nice and tucked away in there, and our guy's like, nah, this doesn't work. And the backpack that it's all in, they just pulled the knot out of the, the webbing knot out and shut the, the, the zipper down, and then all of a sudden, they just got to grab it and go in a, in, a, in a situation where they need to go quick, you know, so instead of just leaving it wrapped. So question, question for you is, this was asked to me the other day, do you leave your webbing tied or untied? See, I leave it tied, and, and I love leave it tied because I think there's more options for it. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say was when you when you think about it, one length, the, the, the one real option for using it in one continuous piece is when I was is if you were going to use it for like the, the trucker's hitch. But mm -hmm. we had to lift the seat. I had to untie it and make it one piece of, of long webbing. Um, but there's about 20 other things that you can come up with. where having it tied, whether it's a hose strap um, there again, moving big lines. I. I'd always take that extra two seconds and put the put the webbing around the hose, girth hitch it. I get it up on my shoulder, and now I can use my upper body um, a lot better doing that. Uh, dra uh, drags, harness. Um, you know, I we could sit here all day, but I definitely like the uh, that. I used to carry it daisy chained, um, but I realized it wasn't usable when it's in a daisy chain. It needs to be pulled out and deployed. Um, so I don't like the I don't like it rolled. Uh, when we taught the class, one thing we found on uh, searching that was somebody had used a latex glove. They put it in a latex glove. I don't like that. Those things rot, tend to rot in your pocket, so I didn't really care for that. Um, I like just flaking it in my pocket, or that's how I have it in my, my radio pouch right now. Is it's, it's just flaked in there, just like a bag rope. When I grab a hold of it, it comes out. It's ready to be used um, for wherever I want to do. So yeah, I, You know, the I quit daisy chaining it after we went to a safety survival class. And the guys blindfolded you, spun you around, handed you your daisy chain webbing, said, here, go, get it out. And you're like, uh, and you sat and fumbled with it. And you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, this is not the way to go. And you're like, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. So, so yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing with all of this stuff that's in your pockets, if you don't practice with it that way, and I'm not going to make it sound like that we're practicing with it because we're not, okay? We're like everybody else. We, we should be training. and it, We're not training enough. And we don't do it on these little things like we're talking about. We don't put our turnout gear on, blindfold ourselves and say, okay, now cut this piece of wire so that you can move. Um, now, we did a training. It's been a long time ago. We did a training, and it was actually revolved around that. And when we did it, a lot of people at that time had a, had a wake-up call that, man, they had the right tool, but they, didn't, they couldn't get to it. It was in the wrong place, or it wasn't usable when they did pull it out. Um, but we have a lot of, of guys now that's, that's newer to that. I think the bigger issue for us is we used to do a lot of that type of stuff, tearing down houses. And about six, seven years ago, oil and gas moved in here. And now a, a dump can be turned into a rental for, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month. So <laughs> the houses really aren't getting torn down. They're being turned into rentals. Right. Um, and, but that's where we used to do all that type of stuff, you know, getting through the walls and pulling people through the floors and stuff like that. And, you know, we don't have a training facility and we don't have the houses to do it. in. it's, it's just gotten a lot harder. So. Yeah. Um, the other thing, when we start talking about these tools, I, you know, I, I always tell guys don't go spend thousands of dollars on the tools, go to the cheap places and get your cutters or, you know, cause you're going to lose them. You're going to break them. You know, mm -hmm. Don't spend thousands upon thousands of dollars. I, you know, I'm a again. I'll throw a brand name out there. Harbor Freight fan. You can go out there and spend them for eight or nine bucks versus the twenty dollar ones at the big box stores. You know, so um, you know, don't. I'm a big fan of that, especially with. And you guys have it too. You guys probably have people that work at two, three, four different places, right? So right. A lot of them, a lot of our guys are just carrying a bag with them now and they just carry it and the bag goes from fire department to fire department. Yep. They don't just, you know. I mean, I'll, I'll admit I'm a gadget person and, you know, my part-time job, I work um, small construction for a guy, my neighbor, uh, I've known him since high school. And, you know, he tells me all the time that I'm the king of gadgets because, <laughs> uh, you know, he'll pull out a screwdriver to take the door off the hinge and I pull out the nifty little Harbor Freight gadget that you you know, and yeah. pop the pin out. Why? You know, there's, uh, you could do the exact same thing for nothing. <laughs> and I bought, right. you know, I bought it for five bucks, but right. you know, 
back to the bow ring you know that's a gadget the you know the cutters that's going to have the the how uh, the prying and the uh all that on it. it's a gadget you know i think you're attracted to it um, and then you realize how how heavy or cumbersome it is. And, and somebody was talking the other day, you know, when I bought when I bought my channel lock uh, cutters with all that stuff on there, it was long and it, it the co- the pocket wouldn't even shut on my on my turnout gear. Then they made a shorter version. With right. a shorter version, uh, I never bought one, but I had one in my hand, and it didn't have the the same amount of force that you could put into it. So, you know. I, you, when you and I were teaching teaching what's in your pockets as a class, you and I were bringing tons of gadgets that we didn't carry anymore. And at the end of the day, you know, a 16 penny nail does the same thing as a $20 gadget from the fire store. No, no offense, but, <laughs> right. you know, but that's also the neat stuff to buy for Christmas presents. You know, right. so most of that stuff I bought as a Christmas present for those people, they're not spending the money and then, you know, they're where for they're keep it on them for a couple of years and they might go to something lighter or better. But um, there's so many things that you can make and do. And Facebook, I think, has made a huge difference in that. I, I mean, especially the stuff that you're posting every day uh, constantly. And I love, you know, taking the uh, the square um, mm-hmm. and, you know, you cut it and then the little pry bar that you can buy for 20 bucks, stick it in there, use the old square that's cut to an angle. You know, th- that works so easy. And, you know, I had like three squares laying around here that was all rusted up. I took them to the station. Uh, one of my guys, uh, my barn boss, because if he's listening, he'll be mad that I said that. But um, <laughs> he uh, he got them all sanded up for us and and cut them and did all the, the work on them. And uh, we did practice with them a couple of times. We really like them. We got them on the engine. Haven't haven't had the opportunity to use them for, for a real situation. But, you know, that... All of that didn't cost more than twenty dollars and a couple of hours worth of time, um, right. versus buying you know the stuff that has got a name stamped on it for fifty some dollars. So you know Facebook has really made a difference, I think, with the videos and all these sites that do all you know that makes those things. Because now it used to be you went to a class to network. Now the networking is done on the network. So right. you know it's done on social media. There's, well, we've lost some probably because I talked too much. But at one point we had 18 people and, uh, you know, somebody might have learned something and 10 of them left. So they probably weren't that interested. But <laughs> it's perfect, dude. There's tons of stuff out on social media anymore. And, and you can learn different stuff off there between your tools and techniques and those kind of things. Obviously, uh, you don't want to be a YouTube warrior and just watch everything off YouTube. You know, don't everything right. off of youtube or facebook but you know educate yourself and study through that stuff and see exactly what works and what doesn't work so that's i mean don't continue to go to classes we want you to go to classes yes anything, but yeah i i definitely don't want to to take away from the fact of not going to the classes the you know we can we can see it we can learn it you know i've never had a man and machine class um uh, I've wanted to go take it. I purchased uh, parts and pieces of it. It's something that I'd really like to have you guys come and do uh, at some point at our de- at our department because it's I I like those technical little things doing that. So I really want to do that. But um, watching it on YouTube and then actually having or going to a class are two totally different things. Um, and then it, that you know it's been a long time since I shouldn't even say that I, I did have a rope class this year now while it wasn't a fire related rope class um, it was Boy Scout related you know I learned things um, in that class uh, because those individuals are not firefighters so I learned a couple of neat little tricks that haven't made it to us but guess what there's a lot of little tricks I knew that they haven't either um, so you can't stop going to the to the classes and stuff and i i had an eye opener you know you and i taught um, all these different rope classes we you know you and i were two of the main people that developed a uh, hunter rescue with jim Doman, kenny saffle um you know there were a handful of people that helped develop at your dad but you and i were the ones that went out and taught it and then i had i stepped back for a couple of years because of some family issues and then guess what? We're teaching a hunter rescue class and Justin Perkowski is like, you know, like wants to do this. I'm like, that's not how you do it. And then I realized I'm three years out of the loop here. You guys were doing competitions. You actually were putting it more to a practical than just a teaching sense. And that's when I had an eye opener that you can't stop going to these classes, you know, 
just because I had, if, if I had a Russ Bourne class 20 years ago, doesn't mean that I'm not going to learn something new from Russ Bourne again. Right. Um, so you, you know, I'd love to go do them, do all that stuff again, money and time and kids make a difference. But um, right. just because you learned it 15 or 20 years ago, doesn't mean you're current on it by no stretch of the imagination. Yeah. <clears throat> So good. Well, let's wrap this up. Any last little bits for any, everybody for the goods of the masses? You got any other tips, tools, techniques, anything you want to talk about before we wrap this up? Because we've been wrapping on there for about 45 minutes now. So yeah. that's probably longer than most people's attention span. I can tell you that. Yeah, a lot of them. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've been up yeah. 18 down to 7, back to 18, or like 11 people yeah. now. But. You know, it, it, I, I, for me, when we started this, I was trying to go through my mind each piece, um, you know, and then elaborate on it. I mean, we've talked about everything that I could think of, I was, you know, and I'm sure people, I wasn't, wasn't looking at comments or, you know, what comes up later, but I'm sure there's a lot of things that people could add to it, but, you know, research and ask, yeah, you know, that's probably the best way to find out what to put in your pockets and what not to put in your pockets even on your own crew, what's in your pocket. I did that yesterday, you right. know, and every, everybody has something a little different. Cause you know what? There was that one call they were on and they didn't have it and they wish they did. And they're going to carry it for another 20 years and never use it again. Right. But they had that one time they need it. They didn't have it. So, yeah. you know, that's how you kind of learn it. <clears throat> well, good point. So um, thanks for coming on here and talking with me today. Uh, just to let everybody know, get on the Facebook, make sure they like it, share our stuff. We're on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Um, if you want to be on here with us one day, just call me and let us know. Hit us up. Hit us on Facebook Messenger. Um, get us a topic, and we can get out here and do a, another live broadcast. So, um, Curtis, thank you very much. Uh, yep. Have a good night. Thanks. You too.